Hi hey everyone. So today I'll be presenting my project on discrete time control contraction metrics for quasi-static planner pushing using smooth dynamics. So first, some motivation. Let's say that we have a robot and we want to do things in the wall. Like, um, let's say put this box somewhere. It's going to have to do it by making contact with the box. In general, anything that we want to do is going to involve planning and control through contact. So it's very important. But there are two things about this that are particularly difficult. The first is that the contact dynamics are not smooth. Sometimes people also use the term hybrid dynamics, but basically there are different contact modes like sticking, sliding, and no contact. And between these modes, whether the forces are within the friction cone or outside of it, the dynamics are different. And the switch between these different modes is also discontinuous. The other challenge is that the system is underactuated. The object can't be controlled directly by the actuators in the robot. And so if we want to change the state of the object, we have to do it mediated through the friction cones at the contact points. So there's some different methods um, that people use to deal with this difficulty. The first is an explicit enumeration of the different contact modes. Uh, in this, we explicitly enumerate all the different modes and then, and as well as the dynamics of each mode um, and have some kind of event detection to let you know when you need to switch the new set of dynamics. Another way that people deal with this is to smooth out these contact dynamics. So this has the effect of making objects be able to apply force to each other at a distance. And one way people have done this um, is the contact dynamics are formulated as an unconstrained optimization problem where the contact constraints, which are normally in the constraints, are moved to the objective of a log barrier function. And so this becomes kind of like a penalty for violating the contact constraints, but it allows it to happen. And um, the log barrier weight determines how much force the constraint can apply even when not being active. And so in this plot on the right, you see that for a low log barrier weight, which corresponds to being able to apply a greater force at the same distance, um, if the log barrier weight is near zero, then the box is pushed beyond x equals two. And if the log barrier weight is around 100, then the box hardly moves. So our approach, the smoothing stuff I just described is important because we're going to be using the smoothing of contact dynamics. And we're going to combine this with control contraction metrics. So a super quick overview on what control contraction metrics are. In class, we learned about control Lyapunov functions, where we choose the controller that makes the closed loop dynamics such that we can find a Lyapunov function that certifies stability. And control contraction metrics are a very similar idea, just a differential version, where we jointly search for a metric and controller such that the contraction condition holds over the region of state space we care about. So there are several advantages um, that control contraction metrics bring us. First is that we get st certificates of stability and convergence rates. And many other methods like nonlinear model predictive control or MPC don't give us these certificates. Second, even compared to other um, methods that do give us certificates like uh, control Lyapunov functions, uh, for those methods, we have to specify a particular equilibrium or trajectory that we want to stabilize to. And for control contraction metrics, they are trajectory independent. Third is synthesizing a control Lyapunov function in isn't convex in general, but synthesizing a CCM is. And so we can do that uh, faster and more reliably. And fourth is that the online computation is supposed to be faster and simpler. For example, compared to solving the nonlinear optimal control problem, problem at every time step in MPC, this should be faster. So, with that, let's get into what we're trying to do with it. The task is a planner pushing task where we have a spherical robot and an unactuated box, and the system evolves in discrete time. The dynamics are analytically smooth, as discussed. Uh, the system is nonlinear, and in this 2D planner pushing case, it's control affine, meaning the control input U comes into the dynamics in this affine way. Now, I'm just going to give the punchline away and show you what I've managed to do. My original idea was to find a CCM of the, with the smooth system and then apply it to the 
non-smooth actual system and have it work. But in order to make the problem of finding a CCM tractable on my computer, I had to use a high level of smoothing. And because I use such a high level of smoothing, the dynamics are just too different from the exact version without smoothing. So the controller doesn't uh, work in the exact dynamics regime. Um, but this is basically the best I could, I could do. What we see here is the desired trajectory um, where we want to push the box in a circle. And remember that everything is constrained to the plane. And so in this first part of the video, the green box is the desired position of the box. And the blue box is the actual position based on an open loop rollout of the desired trajectory. I introduced two disturbances, one um, right at the start, which is an initial offset from the first desired position. And then the second is right around the middle at about right here. You saw there was a, there was a jump um, in the green box. And that's where I have a second desired, like a second radius of desired trajectory. And I instantaneously jump to that other circular trajectory of a different radius. So by the end of the open loop rollout, there's about half a box of difference between the desired and the actual. Uh, yeah. So the million dollar question is, can the CCM I found improve things? And let's take a look. Here, the blue box is the closed loop um, discrete time CCM controller. The green is desired and the red is the open loop controller. So I'll draw your attention to the graphs on the right. At the top, we see both the state, um, the actual state in solid lines and then the desired state in, in dotted lines. Uh, and then in the middle, there's the control inputs. Again, the reference and the, the control inputs by the contraction metric controller. And then at the bottom, we see this geodesic energy, which is supposed to exponentially decrease. So we see that from the initial condition uh, of the, the offset, the controller is able to recover better than the open loop controller. And you know, we see that we see the error get reduced. Right now, there's like almost no error, and we're about to jump instantaneously to the other uh, radius of traject of circular trajectory. And it happens right about now. And then you see like things go a little bit crazy at the start, but then the sphere is able to take corrective action and it knows it needs to go further out in order to push the box back in towards the desired trajectory and it's able to correct. So the error decreases and we can see the geodesic energy also exponentially decreasing. And by the end, basically, this is the result. So uh, I to now I'll talk about how I managed to do this um, and go into the theory. So theory of the discrete time control contraction metric. First, we have the dynamics. So this is in discrete time. Uh, and then this will be the differential dynamics where the A and B matrices are the Jacobians. And then we can define a differential state feedback control law, which tells us the delta U for a particular uh, delta X. So now we can consider this like differential squared distance in the positive def definite mat metric M, uh, which we denote VK. And if we think about the next time step and we substitute in the values of delta XK plus one, then we get our contraction condition where if this is enforced, it's kind of similar to like a negative definite uh, uh, Lyapunov function, where if this is enforced, then basically it means that the system is contracting. So if we're able to find this and we can find our M and K matrices, then the next step we need to do is to, um, when we're running this controller online, is to find this minimum length 
with respect to the metric M curve between our desired state and the actual state. So for a smooth curve, C, uh, parameterized by this S parameter that goes between zero and one, um, that connects two points in state space, the Riemannian length and energy of the curve can be defined in this way. And then the geodesic is basically the curve that minimizes these quantities. And once we have the geodesic, then we can define our tracking controller as the nominal input plus the integral of the geodesic multiplied by the gain matrix. So how do we actually go about synthesizing this controller metric? We can use sums of squares programming and search over the class of polynomials, which are sums of squares. So we start with this contraction condition in terms of the different Lyapunov function that we saw earlier and substitute in the delta axis, um, A and B matrices and K matrices to get this condition, which then we transform using Schur's complement and by left right and right multiplying by invertible matrix to get this condition uh, where this matrix now needs to be positive definite and W is defining to be M inverse and L is KW. And then we put this into the SOS programming like formulation and uh, where omega is, is that matrix that we calculated earlier. Sigma is just the set of polynomials that is sums of squares. R is a relaxation slack variable but that makes solving the problem easier. And um, our mean decision variables are the coefficients of the L and W matrices. And then different from um, how it's done in the paper I was referencing, we want to enforce this over samples because we don't have closed form solutions of the A and B matrices to get the A and B matrices and the next state is actually its own optimization problem. And so the best we can do is like enforce this over samples. So once we have this um, metric and controller, oh wait, one more thing. So going a little bit deeper into just taking a closer look at what, what the W and, and L matrices are, these are like matrices of polynomial expressions where each polynomial expression is formed by dot, having the dot product of the coefficients, which are the decision variables, uh, with the uh, a monomial basis. So what we see here is a monomial basis of degree four, and this actually has like 126 terms. So it's a pretty, pretty huge thing. And so um, one other point I want to make is that because we are enforcing this over samples and there's an upper limit on the number of samples I could add to the optimization pr problem before my computer ran out of memory. So to get the best performance, I just sampled states around my desired trajectory, kind of taking uh, a cloud of possible box positions around this circle and then making sure that the robot at each, at each sample is, is somewhat like behind the box and pushing the box. So now that we have that, then uh, to do the actual online computation of finding the geodesic, we discretize the integral that we saw earlier. And um, here we find the gamma bar, which is the discretized approximation. So similarly, we're minimizing this geodesic or Riemannian energy, and we constrain the start of the geodesic to be where we want to be, our desired position, and the end of the geodesic to be where we actually are. And we make sure all the different segments line up. And then this delta S parameter is like the S that goes from zero to one that parameterizes the curve. So to actually do this, I had to make a few adjustments. First, I had to move the objective down to the constraint and minimize over the epigraph of the function. And I did this because Drake didn't allow me to add 
a non-polynomial class. And then the other thing is that M is this uh, symbolic matrix inverse, which led to the expression being a, a rational polynomial. Um, and so it's not, it's not a, a polynomial cost. Yeah. But the other thing about inverting this symbolic five by five matrix is that it's very uh, complicated and messy. So instead I introduce M as a decision variable as well, and then enforce that M W is the identity. Um, and the last thing I modified is that I added this regularization term, which is the square of the delta s's, and this evens out the length of the segments. So with that, uh, we can calculate the tracking controller um, with this formula. And that's it. We're all done. So onto the results, just as an overview, we found that when using a small amount of smoothing, a higher degree monomial basis, was required to enforce the contraction condition across all the samples. And since the dynamics were less smooth, a greater density of samples was required in order for the contraction condition to hold around the desired trajectory. And this can be seen from the results in this table where even though we're able to synthesize uh, the DCCMs for 500 samples for both log bearer weights, the DCCM for log bearer weight 10 was able to stabilize the system over here, um, while the DCCM for log bear weight 100 and same number of samples was not able to stabilize the system. So both of these factors, you know, requiring a higher degree and more samples led to the optimization becoming intractable because the computer ran out of memory and ultimately we're only able to find a stabilizing controller for log barrier weight 10, which corresponds to the robot exerting 0.1 newtons of force on an object that is one meter away. So this is the these are the plots of the video that I showed earlier. The controller is able to stabilize the system from the initial offset at t equals zero and the step change in the desired trajectory at t equals five with the geodesic energy decreasing exponentially after each instantaneous reference change. So uh, comparing, taking a look at the effect of the number of samples on performance, we see uh, three controllers synthesized with 500, 1,000, and 2,000 samples. And we actually also tested out the controller synthesized with 100 samples, but we didn't include it because that wasn't able to stabilize the system. And we see that as the number of samples increases, the controller is better able to regulate the geodesic energy. For the controller with 500 samples, the geodesic energy doesn't exponentially de decrease. In fact, sometimes it, it increases. And we reason that this is due to the contraction condition not being enforced over all the states um, that the system finds itself in due to the sparse sampling. And it's also interesting to note that though the 2000 sample controller consistently has the lowest geodesic energy, it actually has a big spike in the L2 norm tracking error. And I think this is because like in order to stabilize the system and make the geodesic energy exponentially decrease, the sphere robot has to deviate a greater amount from the reference trajectory in order to push the box back towards the, the reference trajectory leading to that spike in error. And I guess like it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. So we also had some unexplained issues uh, that you know we have, I don't yet have a good explanation for, but I'm thinking more about. The first thing is that in testing, we found that trying to find the geodesic for the planet pushing system, where the number of segments is greater than one consistently fail. And this is unexpected because even though there's more decision variables uh, and acknowledging that this is a non-convex problem, it's interesting that it's not can't find that straight line solution where n equals one. And um, we were able to get a larger n in our implementation of the simpler two-dimensional CSTR um, dynamical system in the paper I was referencing. 
but I did notice that that significantly increased the computation time. And so in future work, we would, I do want to explore warm starting the larger N um, geodesic optimization with the solution for the N equals one geodesic. And then in subsequent iterations, warm starting that with the previous time step solution. And given the smoothness of the system and metric, uh, the previous solutions should serve as a good initial guess. And another very like peculiar observation of the implementation was that the synthesis of the DCCM consistently failed when using a beta greater than 0 0.3. And this is strange because one would think that it would be strictly easier to satisfy a slower convergence rate enforced by the larger beta, but um, yeah, something, something is going on here. And another interesting thing is that like, while I was able to synthesize the DCM, DCCM with 500 samples for both beta 0 0.1 and 0 0.3, the zero, beta 0 0.1 controller was able to stabilize the system while the beta 0 0.3 controller was not. And this may speak to the brittleness of the system when using insufficient samples or maybe indicative of some underlying issue that is also contributing to the synthesis of controllers with larger betas failing. So more investigation is definitely needed um, to fully understand this issue. So just a quick note on the computation times, just to give you a sense of how long these different computations took. Notice that the degree six synthesis is way longer than the degree four synthesis with the same number of samples. Um, and the geodesic calculation, unfortunately, is still like, I think not a bit far from being able to be computed in real time. So that's basically it. Um, in conclusion, what we did manage to do is to synthesize a stabilizing DCCM with highly smooth dynamics for planar pushing. But in terms of all the theoretical benefits of CCMs, we still have we still have more work to be done in order to achieve those. So first, in terms of certificates of stability and convergence rates, uh, because we are doing this sparse sampling and we don't have closed form solutions for the A and B matrices, we would, in order, if we wanted to get a certificate, we would need to make theoretical or mathematical arguments that bound the error due to this sparse sampling. There's another gap, which is the gap between the smooth dynamics and the exact dynamics, which we would also need to put a bound on. And then second is the trajectory independent controller. Because we took samples again uh, and the computational limitations and our particular sampling strategy, we, we weren't able to get a trajectory independent controller. We only enforced it around the desired trajectory. And then in terms of synthesis of the controller, um, we weren't able to synthesize it for the contact dynamics with less smoothing and, and we could explore other ways such as like learning the metric or, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe there's other techniques that can make it more computationally tractable. And then the last thing is like for the faster computation of the control law, I think we definitely have room for improvement, either using these warm starting techniques that I mentioned earlier or trying out pseudo spectral approaches uh, described by some other papers. And then another possible direction, which might be more true to our goals is instead of trying to stabilize the whole system, like the full state, including the position of the robot, maybe we don't really care about the position of the robot. And instead we just want to stabilize to the sub manifold where, where we just care about the position of the object. So that, that's also an interesting direction to explore. And yeah, that's basically it. Thanks for listening to my presentation. And these are our references.